Hello and welcome to Better Than Art School. So this is the third composition lecture and I'm going to explore patterns and grids as a way of talking about the border of the concept of composition. Okay, so in the first composition lecture I said that composition comes from playing opposites off against each other. I took a couple different sets of opposites, unity and variety, uh, clarity and ambiguity, symmetry and asymmetry, just, just to talk about basically trying to get at this idea of variations on a theme. So you have some kind of a theme, say unity, that would be what unity means in a way, and then variations on it, which would be the variety, of course. So that's, that's a good way to think about how to make an interesting composition. And that's just going back to the first composition. And we said that composition is the combination of multiple parts into uni a unified whole. Okay, so if you think about the boundary around a piece of artwork, the cropping of it, the way it's actually, uh, the way you actually decide what to leave in and what to cut out, you can, you can contrast that to a wallpaper in which it just goes on forever. Whatever the module is, whatever the image is, it just kind of goes on. And it, it, where you happen to cut it to fit a wall or whatever is kind of arbitrary versus composition where you're really thinking about the way that you crop it. So that's one way to think about a pattern and a grid is kind of the border of the idea of composition. So patterns and grids are these really common things that you see everywhere. They both organize things visually and they both live on the outer edge of compositional design. So a pattern is a visual element systematically repeated over an extended area, and they're everywhere you look. Just start looking for patterns and you'll, you will see them. A pattern, when you make it in graphic art, is usually you take a module and then you repeat it over you know, however large of an area you need to repeat it. And you can kind of organize it in diagonals, verticals, horizontals, um, but basically you just have this repeating module. And you can kind of create a static or a wallpaper with that, or you can vary them up enough to kind of make its, make its own composition. And both patterns and grids tend to be kind of graphic, not illusionistic, meaning space is very flat in most patterns and grids. Okay, like I was saying, they're, they're everywhere in nature. And you, you might wonder, like, well, why does nature have to use patterns? And patterns serve a lot of functions, like on a zebra, for instance, a pattern will confuse the predator animal that's trying to stalk the zebra because when a bunch of zebras run different ways and all the lines go different ways it's confusing and it kind of throws off the predator it's like visual overload right so there's there's different reasons for patterns sometimes to make something structurally sound sometimes to make something look like eyes looking back at you like in the case of butterflies whatever it is there's different reasons to to do it but they're but they're everywhere and part of the reason is this kind of idea about fractals, that a fractal is something that regardless of how much you zoom in, it looks the same. But a less obvious version of fractals happens all over nature, where if you take my pinky finger, it kind of looks like the rest of me in a certain way. It has a similar degree of angularity to roundness. Um, so this is kind of how nature works, is things are kind of, um, there's, there's a symmetry as deep as you go down within each concise form, if that makes any sense. <laughs> okay, and you can use this idea when you make your own patterns. Like in this case, the squares get smaller and the colors are the same, but the, but the sizes change, and that kind of creates a kind of a fractal kind of idea where you have the same kind of pattern, but it gets smaller and smaller or larger and larger, and it just gives a little variety to the unity. Okay. So in this case, it's kind of using a pattern to create a backdrop for an image that has a composition to it. And this is another composition using a pattern. This is Gustav Klimt and, um, oops, and basically coupling representational imagery. I think this is Wittgenstein, the philosopher's sister, if I'm not mistaken, with a pattern, a lot of gold leaf. Another example of that, Ruprecht, the Kaufman using patterns here in the background, patterns on the shirt, coupling with representational imagery. And then in this kind of sculpture here, what you see is a pattern, you know, hanging on 
ceiling coupled with uh, representational or you know something like a window, an architectural element that we can recognize. Okay, you'll see them in holy places and markets everywhere you go around the world. This is patterns in Islamic art and architecture, patterns in European art and architecture, patterns in Chinese art and fashion, patterns in sculpture. It's everywhere, everywhere you go. People use patterns. People love patterns. This is a kind of a philosophical idea about patterns. And I think what Isaiah Berlin is saying here is that to understand is, well, the, the quote is to understand is to perceive patterns. But it's easy to get caught off guard by every new object, by every new thing. But if you step back far enough to see a repeating pattern, you realize that regardless of what's happening in your life, there's a pattern here and that you've been through something like this before in a different guise. So that's, that's what I think this quote is about. Okay, so next visual organization idea is grids. Um, and a grid is, is a little different than a pattern because a grid uses intersecting lines to organize visual information, whereas patterns tend to use a repeating shape. And of course, if you are engineering a city, if you're designing a city, you're going to use intersecting lines because the lines would be streets and or sidewalks or whatever it is and you you have to organize a city to where it's uh, you can navigate through it right so if you're ever in new york city you can walk up and down for miles and it's in manhattan and it's just a big grid it's a simple grid it breaks down in some little areas but for the most part it's very easy to not get lost in new york because of that okay a grid is built of smaller structures or structural principles or p to form a larger organization of formal elements. So if you cut out a little square out of this, it kind of looks similar to the rest of it. Uh, grids can be rectilinear, most are rectilinear. We think of grids as rectilinear, but they can be curvilinear. So a honeycomb, for example, is a nature version of a grid, and it's a nature version of a more curvilinear kind of a grid. And so grids can structurally give something more surface area and these intersecting lines can make something more robust. They can reinforce a structure. So that's, I think, why nature uses grids. Grids, like patterns, are usually flat. They're usually organized on the x-axis and the y-axis, not going into the picture. And this is very famous. Artists use grids, Mondrian. And even if you take it off of the canvas and use this Kind of grid idea on boxes or shoes or dresses it still holds up it still organizes the visual information in a pleasing kind of way so andy warhol kind of organized some of his most famous art through grids even though you might say this is a pattern because it's a repeated shape but it's organized through a grid damien hurst organizing these butterflies in a kind of a grid kind of idea and just to be clear so both patterns and grids can either be compositions or not. They can be a wallpaper, they can be a composition, and we could argue about which ones are which. But it helps to kind of define or understand composition when you can kind of see the, the outside border around such a concept. Okay, I hope that helps, and I will see you all next time.